Welcome to the Free Market Forum. My name is Bert Folsom. I'm professor of history at Hillsdale College, and I'm on the advisory board for the Free Market Forum. Our first session today is the relationship of economic liberty to civil and religious liberty, the case of China. We have three excellent speakers, and I wanted to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Charles Wolf. Uh, Dr. Wolf holds the distinguished chair in international economics at the Rand Graduate School and is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard University. Dr. Wolf has served with the U.S. Department of State and has taught at Cornell University and at the University of California at Berkeley. He is the founding dean of the Pardee Rand Graduate School. In the year 2007, Dr. Wolf received the Order of the Rising Sun from the government of Japan for helping to inform the U.S. about Japan through his balanced analyses of Japan's economy. This is Japan's highest academic honor. Welcome, Dr. Wolf. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, gracious uh, invitation, uh, introduction, um, uh, and, and good morning to all of you ladies and gentlemen. I was uh, asked in the elevator uh, coming down this morning whether I was, quote, all fired up for this uh, uh, session to which I uh, answered, I'm still on Pacific Coast time, uh, so it's a little bit earlier than I usually get fired up at. Uh, so I uh, wish those of you who, like me, are on Pacific time, uh, particularly uh, a special uh, good morning uh, and we'll try to get you a little fired up uh, as I go along. Um, you're all familiar with uh, so-called takeaways from uh, a paper or talk like this, and I will have something to say about <clears throat> takeaways later on, but I'd like to start with a sort of a, a preamble to this talk uh, with something I'll refer to as bring-alongs, as distinct from takeaways. Bring-alongs are a couple of, of, uh, of points that I'd like us and I'd like you to bear in mind as I proceed, uh, because they will uh, be relevant to a lot of the uh, remarks that I make before I get to the takeaways. Now there are two bring-alongs that are uh, displayed on the, on the uh, chart that you see. Um, one relates to the link between and distinction between uh, freedom from various constraints and liberty to act, to do various things. And uh, both of these are especially prominent uh, in the realm of economic liberty, uh, freedom from excessive taxation, freedom from excessive regulation, freedom from capricious uh, and arbitrary regulation and liberty to uh, do what uh, a, the late Ronald Coase, a former recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics, referred to as capitalism with socialist uh, uh, characteristics or 
capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, in the realm of economic liberty, uh, the freedom from the uh, excessive uh, taxation and regulation is linked with uh, liberty to engage in all of the activities that entrepreneurs and new startups and expansion uh, and recession of existing uh, industries uh, go through in capitalist systems like ours, expanding into new markets, uh, hiring, and subject to certain constraints, firing, uh, opening new markets abroad as well as at home and so forth. So um, economic uh, liberty in China is pervaded by uh, freedom from and and uh, liberty to act. Uh, civil and, and religious liberty uh, are pervaded by ambiguity of what is free from and what is liberty to act. Lately in the uh, domain of religious liberty, there's been a uh, complaint and criticism and attempted control of the number and size of crosses in uh, Christian churches. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, there's more to be said about this, but I, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, interestingly enough, there have been there has been a, a, a counters contesting of these control attempts by the churches uh, affected both both Catholic and, and Protestant in in China. So uh, the domains of civil and, liber and, and religious liberty are much more ambiguous and much more constrained uh, than is the case with uh, economic liberty. The second, so that's a bring along that I'd like you to bear in mind as I proceed. The second bring along is what I've referred to as three T's and one S. The three T's are Tibet, Taiwan, and Tiananmen Square, and the S is the student protests over the last several years in, in um, Hong Kong, uh, which is also referred to as the umbrella movement. I can explain that later, later on. Uh, and these are subjects that are, are uh, not supposed to be discussed in public and not even to be discussed in private. Uh, lest there be consequences from discussing them. They are, it is politically incorrect in China to discuss uh, Tibet, Taiwan, Tiananmen Square. Uh, it's politically incorrect to discuss the student uh, protests. So these are, these are uh, two of the bring-alongs I'd like you to bear in mind as I proceed. Now, with respect to uh, economic liberty, um, this may anticipate the next speaker. I'm uh, reasonably optimistic uh, about the prospects over the, in the coming years uh, for several reasons. The first reason, uh, which I just allude to, but takes longer to, to elaborate, uh, relates to the documents uh, accompanying and succeeding the third and fourth party plenums in 2013, 2014. The party plenums essentially bring together the top uh, 1,000 or 1,200 uh, members of the 16 tiered so-called quote, classless unquote society in, in China uh, for uh, a week or two weeks of, of discussions and uh, a lot of, of of uh, planning and preparation and drafting and redrafting and comments and so forth uh, precede in, in the weeks before the, the plenums. 
they're, they're uh, convening. Uh, but, but studying the, the uh, so these are documents that are taken uh, more seriously than the State of the Union messages taken by, uh, by the President in the US. Uh, if you look at them, examine them carefully, they uh, extol the accomplishments both of the uh, private sector in China and the public sector, but there's a nuance of, of emphasis and preference and, and accreditation to the accomplishments of the, of the private sector. Uh, so that's one reason, one set of reasons relating to the reasonably optimistic outlook that I, I would suggest to you for uh, the private, the, the, for economic liberty in the coming uh, years. The other <clears throat> reason or set of reasons for at least modest optimism relates to the data on both the uh, private and, and uh, state sectors. Over the last decade, uh, and even con continuing into the slowdown period of the last three or four years, um, the rate of growth in the private sector has doubled, has been twice that of the uh, state sector. State sector including SOEs, state-owned enterprises, uh, and, and the government itself. So that now about 60% of the uh, G GDP of China originates in the private sector and 40% uh, in the state and, and uh, uh, public sector. Uh, that's a little bit better in the sense of a larger relative private sector than most of the 27 countries in the European Union. It's a little bit worse in, that, in terms of that ca uh, categorization uh, than the proportions in the U.S. Um, similarly, the, the increase in employment in the private sector uh, over the last decade has been three or four times the uh, employment increases in the, in the state sector. And indeed, there's even a pushback in the state sector from some of the SOEs who seeing the uh, the dramatic as well as, as lucrative consequences in the private sector uh, for companies like Alibaba and Huawei and ZTE, uh, which have, have uh, grown uh, remarkably uh, in, their, in their global business with very lucrative consequences for Jack Ma uh, and other a billionaire uh, and entrepreneurs in those companies over the last uh, uh, couple of decades. Um, so, so the data suggest uh, uh, optimistic uh, accomplishments thus far and, and uh, pro projected into, into the future uh, in the coming, in the coming uh, years. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with a concluding point about the uh, outlook for the private sector uh, in, in terms of a syllogism whose major premise, and, and this is, is a premise that though rarely discussed is, is integral to Xi Jinping's, the, the uh, president and chairman of the of the Standing Committee of the, of the Political Bureau, uh, the seven uh, men who constitute the, uh, the oligarchy that, that runs uh, China, or at least attempts to. Um, uh, and and this, the major premise of the syllogism is that the continuity and longevity of the Communist Party in China depends heavily on uh, reducing, if not eliminating, the pervasive corruption uh, that is manifest uh, throughout the system. And that, of course, is uh, a major part of Xi Jinping's uh, platform in 
his leadership, which began two, two uh, years ago. The, the, the minor, the secondary uh, premise is that as long as the state sector is prominent in China's economy, the incentives for corruption will be enormous and lucrative and irresistible. Uh, so the uh, inference, the concluding premise that is drawn from the major and minor uh, premise of the syllogism is that the, the size and scope and, and reach of the state sector should be reduced. That is, less uh, prominence of the uh, state sector will be conducive to less uh, corruption. So even apart from the data, and even apart from the relative, uh, the data that I referred to, and the relative uh, uh, growth and innovation displayed in the private sector, even apart from those data, uh, the, the conclusion drawn by the, the rulers of, of China is that the state sector should be, should be diminished. Uh, next point to move to civil liberty. Uh, one way of scaling, trying to get a, a fix on the uh, state of an outlook for uh, civil liberty is to look at the ratings of Freedom House in 2050. They have a, a rating system that has seven dimensions and, and results in three categories for 195 countries that they evaluate every year and have done so for the last 20 years, uh, resulting in three categories, free, partly free, and not free. And uh, there are about two dozen of the 195 countries that are in the not free category, and they are divided, further divided into two tiers the, the least free and the somewhat less, uh, still not free, but, but uh, a little bit freer than the, than the least free. And China is in the second tier of the worst uh, couple of dozen countries uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Freedom House ratings, uh, which are replicated by other ratings, the Fraser Institute and a number of other, of other sources. So China's civil liberty rating is better than that of North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. Uh, it's at the same level as Cuba, Ethiopia, and Crimea since uh, the Russians, uh, since Putin annexed uh, Crimea last year. Um, and it's lower, it's less, free than Iran, Egypt, and Algeria. Uh, so th that's uh, so much for the, for the rating of civil liberty by the Freedom House. Um, but there's another element uh, which is in the, in the chart that you see now uh, that sharply differentiates the quality or the texture of civil liberty in China from that in, in, uh, in the U.S. And, and in the West. In the U.S., uh, a core among our values, a core value is diversity and pluralism, which is attested to by the huge number, two and a half million uh, NPOs that uh, are uh, incentivized through tax exemptions uh, so that we have pro-life and pro-choice, we have Second Amendment and, and gun control uh, advocacy, we have uh, straight and gays and so forth and so on. We have a, a, a range of, of diverse plural uh, uh, entities that are incentivized uh, and, and that constitutes the, the fabric, the texture, the quality of of civil liberty in the US. In China, 
though there was a lot of, and encouragingly so, of uh, discussion of civil society. Um, w one of the party plenums, I think it was the fourth party plenum, uh, referred to the uh, development of, an uh, increased development of civil society as, uh, as including uh, this is the third bullet on the, on the chart, uh, developing new think tanks with Chinese characteristics to establish a policy-making constituency. So the, the, the quality, the texture, the concept of civil liberty in China is to have multiple sources of support of a constituency for government policy. That includes the development of new ideas, it's a positive sign, but the new ideas are supposed to be supportive of the CPC, the, 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 the Communist Party of China's uh, uh, general program and uh, its monopoly of power. So there's a fundamental difference in the meaning of civil liberty in China and, and in, in the West. One, the last bullet on, on the chart uh, relates to something we should talk about later in the discussion about the enormous proliferation of the internet and, and uh, uh, social media, 700 million uh, and counting uh, participants in the internet and social media in China and still and still growing. So this is a, a source of, of civil liberty and a counter to the, to the, uh, uh, the concept of civil liberty that is espoused by uh, the top leadership. Uh, my time is, is running out, so let me race through re religious liberty um, is guaranteed to quote all citizens of China in the uh, Article 36 of the Chinese Constitution. However, there's an equally uh, severe restriction on civil liberty, uh, on, on religious liberty. Uh, as a mandate of membership in the Communist Party. There are 85 million plus uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party, and one of the criteria for membership is uh, non-theistic religious commitment. Uh, the Chinese Constitution distinguishes between theistic religions, uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, and uh, Islam, uh, and atheistic religions, including uh, Taoism and Buddhism. Confucianism is in a different category. We can talk about that. It's not viewed as a religion. It's viewed as uh, integral to the communist uh, uh, attempt uh, at meritocracy and discipline and the worth, work ethic, it's not viewed as a religion, it's viewed as part of the moral fabric of, of Chinese uh, uh, culture. Um, again, in the realm of, of religious liberty, it's okay in China for, uh, for religions, uh, especially the atheistic religions, but also theistic religions, uh, to be um, practiced if they're practiced locally and if they are not part of a protest organized fundraising movement. Uh, but if they move into uh, those dimensions where they are viewed as a movement, as distinct from a locally uh, decentralized uh, practice of, of uh, religious belief, they're subject to the sorts of constraints that I mentioned. So um, I will leave the discussion of religious liberty to 
uh, the later uh, Q&A, and th the last uh, chart will ha has the, the um, uh, takeaways in the first bullet that you can see, uh, and then I've attempted to formulate them in terms of three uh, scenarios, continuity, uh, adversity, uh, and modernity, uh, which we can talk about again in the, in the uh, uh, Q&A and discussion. Uh, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty connected with the future, uh, and I've characterized one kind of uncertainty as Heisenbergium. How, how many of you have ever heard of Werner Heisenberg? Okay, well, that, that's the kind of uncertainty that's, that's uh, irresolvable uh, because it depends on the observer uh, whose location affects the position and velocity of what is being observed. So that in addition to the pervasive uncertainty about these scenarios, there's a Heisenbergian uh, uh, uncertainty that uh, is additional to that. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll, we can continue the discussion later. Thank you. Our next speaker is George Gilder. There. Uh, George Gilder is the best-selling author. He's chairman of the George Gilder Fund Management, and he's the founding fellow at the Discovery Institute. He was educated at Exeter Academy and Harvard University. Two of his early books were Men and Marriage and Wealth and Poverty, the last of which led to Mr. Gilder being President Ronald Reagan's most frequently quoted living author. Those two books also influenced me I read two earlier incarnations of Men and Marriage, which were called, that Mr. Gilder wrote, entitled Sexual Suicide and Naked Nomads. <laughs> I was a single man at the time, completing graduate school and beginning my teaching career. And the thesis of the books were that single men were not going to be successful and they weren't going to live a very long time. <laughs> Wisely, the next year I began dating Anita <laughs> and married her. Look at you now. <laughs> <laughs> I got to marry the director of the Free Market Forum, thrown in as a bonus. And two years after our marital bliss, Mr. Gilder came out with his book, Wealth and Poverty, so of course I had to read that as well, and that book emphasized the value of economic freedom and the enterprise that is produced in an atmosphere of economic freedom. And I went on to write uh, the book applying those principles to the early part of the United States, the industrial history. Of, I was influenced by that book in writing my book, The Myth of the Robber Barons. So I appreciate Mr. Gilder's productivity, he has since gone on to write The Spirit of Enterprise, Microcosm, Telecosm, a variety of books, including The Israel Test. In that book, he argues that hostility toward Israel arises primarily from hostility toward capitalist creativity. His most recent book, Knowledge and Power, uh, has been written, and of course, uh, Mr. Gilder is affiliated with the Discovery Institute in his work. He also writes regularly for the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The American Spectator. He lives in the Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts with his wife and is the parent of four children. Please welcome George Gilder. Thank you, Bert, and uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. At Hillsdale, I went to Harvard, but my heart is in Hillsdale. <laughs> Harvard is really a depraved institution now, in my view. Eighty percent of the kids advocate disinvestment from Israel. <laughs> 
They're anti-Semites at Harvard. They don't know it really, but they are. They're profoundly anti-Semitic, anti-capitalist. Uh, it's a really, I'm serious that it is uh, becoming, like most of the Ivy League, uh, a depraved institution. And uh, that's why what Hillsdale is doing is so important to this country. And equally important to this country is resolving this conflict between uh, civil liberties, democracy, all these uh, values which um, many people in America think are absolutely central to human life and economic activity which is actually uh, the preoccupation of most of us in most of our activities. Most of our key freedoms really do relate to our economic lives. They're the domain where we actually create and uh, launch new entities and ventures and uh, change the world. And uh, these conflicts I didn't really resolve in wealth and poverty. Uh, there, was, uh, there were two sides of wealth and poverty, my celebration of conservative values and religious uh, convictions, and my celebration of supply-side economics which was essentially based on a model of human beings that I think is degrading. But uh, this model of human beings affects all our views of capitalism. Uh, it's a model of a human being as homo economicus, economic man. And when you scrutinize economic man, He's a tool of his incentives. He's uh, optimizing for pleasure, uh, resisting pain. It's really a survival in economic theory of the psychological analysis of the Skinner box, another great Harvard professor who imagined that all human psychology could be summed up as a version of stimulus and response, that uh, if you uh, uh, raised a human being in a Skinner box, uh, that uh, you could completely shape uh, their views uh, uh, and uh, that essentially human beings are a function of their environments, they're a function. And uh, since then, I've been studying information theory and uh, developing an information theory of capitalism. And that is really, that's the subject of knowledge and power. It's uh, the information theory of capitalism. And it contends that capitalism is not chiefly an incentive system. It's an it's an information system. And that wealth is primarily knowledge. Thomas Sowell long ago, 1971, wrote that after all, we know this because the Neanderthal in his cave had all the material resources that we have today. All the difference between the Stone Age and our age comes from the accumulation of knowledge. Knowledge is wealth. And uh, wealth, wealth is knowledge, but it's a particular kind of knowledge. It's tested knowledge. And uh, uh, the key to it is a phenomenon that is, that I just, I wrote about a lot in the spirit of enterprise and which is the most tested uh, principle in all business consultancy and that is the learning curve. And uh, learning curves are manifested all across 
of a capitalist economy. Uh, every time you double total units sold uh, in an industry, you uh, costs drop between 20 and 30 percent. And uh, so learning, and uh, the Boston Consulting Group and Bain and company uh, have uh, documented literally scores of thousands of learning curves. And uh, Michael Rothschild wrote a book that extended the learning curve to um, rainforest slime molds. Uh, it seems to be a fundamental biological principle as well. And so uh, wealth is knowledge, growth is learning. And uh, learning in capitalism comes for, because every business is the entrepreneurial test of a uh, business idea. And so it's falsifiable, it can go broke. Unless a scientific proposition is falsifiable, can be disproven, as uh, Karl Popper showed, uh, it's not uh, scientific. And that's why so crucial, if something is government guaranteed, it can't produce learning, and thus it can't produce wealth or growth. So, well, the heart of the U.S. economy for the last uh, uh, 50 years has been venture capital. Venture capital uh, represent companies started by venture capitalists represent some 21% of our GDP, uh, almost all the most innovative parts of our GDP. They, uh, companies started by venture capitalists, financed by them, represent 17% of all our jobs, and uh, spin-off jobs mean that really most of job growth, I think, derives from our venture capital fabric. Uh, and uh, venture capital accounts for some 65% of all market cap of American corporations on <coughs> NASDAQ. So uh, this is really critical, this entrepreneurial uh, heart of the American economy where uh, uh, companies are uh, started, they, they're creative in the image of their creator, they're creating new things. Now how is this relevant to China? Zhang Jimen is really, uh, I believe, one of the great figures in the history of economics. Zhang was uh, mayor of Shanghai when uh, China launched, uh, with his guidance, the free zone strategy. And that, I think, the free zone strategy that they launched back in the uh, late, late 80s, early 90s, is really the source of uh, Chinese success compared, for example, uh, to the strategy of emancipation from the center that was launched in uh, the Soviet Union. If you try to free a country from the center out, uh, you arouse all the resistance of everybody who has a who benefits from the existing order. But uh, the free zone strategy that Deng Xiaoping and uh, Jiang Zemin established instead uh, created the opposite dynamic. Once you establish a set of free zones where capitalism can flourish, then all the action happens in the free zones and everybody wants to move into the free zones and uh, the dynamic is to expand the free zones and have more free zones. And that's really uh, the dynamic that uh, accounts for the uh, ch uh, Chinese miracle of growth. And I think it really did 
originate with uh, Zhang Zemin, who is a fast, fascinating figure. And, and to understand China, it's really important to understand him. He, he loved the United States. He could, if he were up here today, he could recite the Gettysburg Address to you word for word. He, he, uh, he's, uh, he regarded NASDAQ and the IPO system in the United States as the crowning glory of everything that's great about America. He befriended a whole series of American uh, semiconductor industry figures. His son studied uh, with American semiconductor people and started a, a chip foundry in uh, Shanghai called Grace Semiconductor. And, uh, and uh, Zhang, son, Zhang was not a Christian, but, but he admired Christianity. But Zhang's son uh, uh, demanded that uh, in exchange for the, uh, having this uh, foundry placed in Shanghai rather than in the United States or Taiwan, uh, that they build two Christian churches. And uh, this was uh, that the authorities authorized the building of two Christian churches. And Grace Semiconductor is kind of, uh, uh, it hasn't been a great success, but it is a Christian uh, institution and in business. Uh, but Jiang also uh, does embody some of the contradictions of China because uh, he initiated the persecution of the Falun Gong. And uh, he, was, uh, he took office as president after Tiananmen Square. And uh, so he was a, a tough guy, uh, but uh, he embodied the commitment to free zones and capitalism in NASDAQ. And as a result, they established a NASDAQ in China, in Shenzhen, and, uh, which is now linked to the Hong Kong exchange. And uh, what I, the message I really want to leave with you today, the key message is that the United States really is delusional if it makes China an enemy. The very future of our economy, our society, our life as free people, our uh, avoidance of absolutely horrific global uh, turmoil and war depends on us coming to terms with of China, with China and its uh, awesome economic capabilities. Because I just told you about uh, uh, a US IPO, uh, uh, initial public offerings, NASDAQ, venture capital, all that uh, has been the heart of the US economy. We're now losing it a bit. Uh, we don't have IPOs so much anymore. And this year, China massively passed the United States in IPOs. It, uh, it now has twice as many IPOs as we do and about twice as many uh, at, and are uh, investing about twice as much money in them. And uh, they are not worse IPOs than American IPOs. They have a greater emphasis on hardcore uh, technology than American IPOs do. And uh, if uh, the Chinese IPO uh, capabilities, initial public offerings of new companies uh, are uh, now twice as uh, great as uh, the US, uh, venture capital is close behind. Uh, Chinese venture capital just passed uh, Europe and uh, they do have raised three times as much money as all of Europe for venture capital. And uh, they're, 
They are about half as much as U.S. venture capital. But U.S. venture capital is in a strange phase today because of the unicorn phenomenon, uh, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, EPA, uh, the uh, uh, FDA uh, just uh, stopped a major American front page of the Wall Street Journal today tells how uh, the FDA decided to stop Theranos from collecting blood from people because the device they use to collect blood is a new medical instrument that has to go through the FDA uh, gauntlet. The EPA just banned carbon nanotubes, which is, uh, was a, a great American uh, invention that is a uh, discovery really that uh, uh, we've long believed had huge promise and uh, the EPA casually uh, said no, it causes cancer. Uh, there are billions of car tr trillions of carbon nanotubes in all your fireplaces uh, and uh, the next step really should be to ban fireplaces. But in any case, uh, China, is a complex country. It uh, it's, has a kind of confused, confusing image because uh, its modern capitalist um, manifestation is, uh, which is uh, real and powerful, uh, harbors beneath it a kind of uh, vestigial reptilian brain of, of uh, represented by the communist apparatchiks. And, uh, and they do control most, most, much of the country, uh, but, they do not con but they do not really control this runaway capitalist efflorescence that uh, I see every time I go to Asia. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just an awesome uh, uh, phenomenon. And uh, I'm really, I, I really devoutly say we don't want to, uh, we, we're not going to dominate Asia. Taiwan has already, uh, all of Taiwan's investments is, are in the mainland. The Taiwan has come to terms with mainland China. If there, the people who believe that politics is all that matters uh, will, uh, worry about Taiwan and uh, think the U.S. should continue to have some sort of implicit military commitment to defending Taiwan, it's, it's idiocy. We can't, we can't convey to these people that we really might go to China to defend Taiwan. China's whole semiconductor industry is really dependent on Taiwan. Our semiconductor industry is largely dependent on Taiwan. And we, we think we're going to have a war uh, to uh, defend Taiwan. Uh, it's it just China is dominant in Asia and will be go, grow increasingly dominant. And we have to come to terms with that. And the world has to come to terms with that. Uh, but I think it's a wonderfully optimistic development that capitalism is flourishing in China today. Uh, governments, China just... Uh, privatized its post office. Uh, that, you know, whether, whether, whether China is going to uh, 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 be, uh, you know, what these numbers mean, but Chinese government spending, as they categorize it, is only 17% of GDP. It's less than ours, half of ours. This is because the private sector has been growing so much faster than uh, the public sector in China. And uh, China, we have lots of lessons to learn from them about how uh, to uh, dismantle regulation. I mean, we, we are in a regulatory morass in the United States and our own capitalism is in jeopardy. Thank you. Thank you, George. Our final speaker is Paul Ray.
And Dr. Paul Ray holds the Charles Lee and Louise Lee Chair in Western Heritage at Hillsdale College. He has taught at several universities, including many years on the faculty at the University of Tulsa. In 1992, Paul published Republics Ancient and Modern, Classical Republicanism and the American Revolution. Other works include Against Throne and Altar, Machiavelli and Political Theory Under the English Republic, and another book, Soft Despotism, Democracy's Drift, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Tocqueville on the Modern Prospect. He was also editor of the book Machiavelli's Liberal Republican Legacy, published in 2006. Dr. Ray was a Rhodes Scholar and received his PhD from Yale University in, in 1977. In the spring of the next year, Yale University Press will publish The Spartan Regime, Professor Ray's latest book. And Paul is a frequent contributor on contemporary politics and culture on the website Ricochet. He has very good columns on that website. I highly recommend it. Today, he's going to be taking an, a view opposite to that of George Gilder. His subject is going to be a critical view of China. Thank you. Uh, I've been watching China now as an amateur, untutored in the language, but attentive to what I could glean about the country's culture and institutions for nearly 60 years. Like nearly everyone else, I've been delighted and in some measure amazed by the transformation that has taken place over the last three decades. Never in human history has an economically backward country advanced so far, so fast. Uh, back in the 1960s uh, and 70s, uh, China looked like a mildly improved version of today's North Korea. The people were, for the most part, desperately poor and profoundly ignorant of the larger world. Access to information was tightly controlled. There was little, if any, room for political disagreement. There was no private property, and purges were routine. In his ruthlessness and his cruelty and brutality, Mao Zedong made Joseph Stalin look positively humane. Today's China may not be a paradise. It certainly is not a completely open society. It is not cosmopolitan, nor is it in any way, shape, or form a democracy, but it is comparatively prosperous. It is not closed to the larger world. It is astonishingly dynamic, and within certain limits, public policy can be discussed. Moreover, uh, there's an opening to the West that no one's mentioned here of a scholarly sort. Uh, almost all the canons of Western political thought and Western economic thought have been tra translated into Chinese. And now they're digging away at the scholarship. My, my own book, Republic's Ancient Modern, published in 1992, is coming out in Chinese in three volumes in this year, next year, and the year after. It's really quite remarkable. Um, However, however, I'm not sure it isn't George Gilder who is delusional, as I will try to explain to you. Uh, in 1967, in the lead up to his nomination as the Republican Party presidential candidate the following year, Richard Nixon gave a speech in which he urged that we persuade China that it must change. Taking the long view, he argued, we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations, there to nurture its fantasies, it cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. As his choice of language suggests, Nixon's hope, and that of many another American policymaker in his wake, was that our opening to China, which Nixon and Kissinger forged, would not only give rise to economic development, but would also affect a transformation in the political culture of the country. He and they hoped that over time, contact and commerce with the outside world would dispel prejudice and hostility, would promote interdependence and amity, and would foster the incorporation of China within a world system devoted to accommodating the real material interests of its members. He and they also hoped that this opening would transform China internally. They would give rise to a literate, well-informed middle class equipped 
with a benign cosmopolitan outlook that this class would demand a say in public policy and that the demise of totalitarianism in China, prerequisite for commercial prosperity, would lead to a decline in Chinese authoritarianism and the gradual emergence there of a liberal democracy on something like the Western model. These hopes were by no means utopian. They were in fact an expansion of a project intimated in 1748 uh, in the Baron de Montesquieu's Spirit of Laws, and then re-articulated and refined in 1795 in Immanuel Kant's essay on perpetual peace. In one chapter of his prescient work, Montesquieu had argued commerce cures destructive prejudices, and it is an almost general rule that everywhere there are gentle mores, there is commerce, and that everywhere there is commerce, there are gentle mores. Therefore, one should not be surprised if our mores are less fierce than they were formerly. Commerce has spread knowledge of the mores of all nations everywhere. They have been compared to each other, and good things have come from this. In a chapter sequel, he then added, the natural effect of commerce is to lead to peace. Two nations that trade with each other become reciprocally dependent. If one has an interest in buying, the other has an interest in selling, and all unions are founded on mutual needs. But if the spirit of commerce unites nations, it does not unite individuals in the same way. We see that in countries where one is affected only by the spirit of commerce, there is traffic in all human activities and all moral virtues. The smallest things, those required by humanity, are given for money. Elsewhere in his book, Montesquieu intimates a connection between extensive commerce and political liberty, suggesting that the English know best how to take advantage of them both. And he mentions even the colonies in America where great nations are going to grow up with English institutions. If the English model were adopted everywhere, he intimates, there might be less grandeur in the world, less nobility, less generosity. But at the same time, wars would be less frequent and liberty more common. In his essay, Immanuel Kant took up this theme, suggesting that if certain conditions were met, there might be perpetual peace, in implying that the prerequisite conditions might soon be met. He's writing in the age of the French Revolution. In a world constituted by democracies and unfettered press and freedom of trade, if these democracies formed a mutual defense pact and a league of nations to serve as a forum and locus for negotiation, they could work their will within the world, crush despotism, and maintain peace with one another. The thesis sketched out in part by Montesquieu and developed in full by Kant formed the basis for American policy in the post-World War II world. With an eye to tempering nationalism and promoting cooperation, we founded the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. We promoted regional defense pacts and free trade and encouraged the negotiations that produced uh, between Germany and France, the European coal and steel community that later gave rise to the common market and that eventuated in the European Union. For 70 years as a consequence of the efforts undertaken by the Europeans in those years and with our encouragement, there has been peace in Europe matched with a measure of prosperity hitherto unknown and supported by vibrant democratic institutions. After World War II, we fostered something similar in Japan. We had similar success in South Korea and Taiwan. We maintained good relations with Australia and New Zealand on similar terms. In fact, in cooperation with like-minded nations, we created a liberal international order that kept the peace and gave rise to an astonishing measure of prosperity. All that Richard Nixon proposed in 1967 was to incorporate China gradually and unobtrusively into this new world order. I will have to confess that I never believed in the rosy scenario imagined by Nixon and the China enthusiasts, and I do not believe in it now. We were able to do what we did in Europe and Japan because they were devastated and demoralized. And the demoralized part, I think, was the most important aspect to, of it. They were on their backs. The French and the Germans were willing to give up their animosity uh, with regard to one another. The Japanese had lost 2.5 million people in the Second World War. China, by way of contrast, is the proud heir of an ancient civilization. 
It has never had viable representative institutions of the sort that everyone in Europe had at one time or another, and that Japan had for a time uh, from stretching from about the 1890s into the through the 1920s. And to the extent that, J that China has ever embraced anything Western, it was Marxism, the communism promoted by the Soviet Union and totalitarian rule. Moreover, the Confucian ethos of pre-communist China was authoritarian. China in the 1980s may have been poor and backward, but it was neither devastated nor defeated. In many ways, as Nixon expected, it would, as it opened up, profoundly change. But it was apt, once it entered the family of nations, to continue to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. When we consider the conduct of today's China, we should think about Germany in the period stretching from 1871 to 1914. In these years, the latter experienced economic growth and urbanization on a scale and at a pace unprecedented. In 1871, Germany was an economic backwater. In 1900, its steel production exceeded that of Great Britain. In some ways, Germany was then better situated than China would be later. It was Western, it was Christian, it had long had representative institutions. Nonetheless, the constitution devised for the Kaiserreich by Otto von Bismarck was designed to neuter those institutions and to perpetuate and extend in Germany as a whole, to and extend to Germany as a whole, the rule of Prussia's king and of the younger, nobil you know, the younger nobil nobility that had long been the monarchy's mainstay. There was in Germany private property. Commerce flourished in these years. Internationally, free trade was the norm. Germany's commerce with its neighbors expanded by leaps and bounds, and its urban middle class grew greatly in number, weight, and importance. But none of this prevented the Germans from nurturing their fantasies, cherishing their hates, and threatening their neighbors. Germany's was by its situation a land power, as is China. Controlling the sea was not essential to Germany's security. In fact, seeking to control the sea was apt to weaken Germany by alienating neighbors who would otherwise have been friendly. Great Britain had long followed a policy of splendid isolation. It would never have allied with Russia and France had the Germans not devoted their steel production to the building of a fleet of battleships. Now, if I dwell on the conduct of the Kaiserreich uh, in, in the early years of the last century, or the, actually not the last century, the previous century, it is because China is doing precisely what Germany did then. China is now wealthy. She has the wherewithal to become a major military power. And instead of focusing on the defense of her territory, she has turned to the sea. She has developed ballistic missiles accurate enough to wipe out in short order every base we have in or near Asia. She insists on her ownership of the uninhabited islands and reefs and sea lanes well off her coast and seeks to bully Vietnam, Taiwan, the Philippines, Japan, and other countries whose security requires in this region full freedom of the seas. If we do not forge a defensive alliance of sorts within this region capable of deterring Chinese aggression, these states will in, will in time all become satellites of China, and before long we will be confronted by another greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. The Chinese do not seem to be willing to abide by the rules of the international world order that we have built. In 1994, Richard Nixon remarked to William Sapphire, we may have created a Frankenstein. There's another reason why I'm not sanguine. There's apt to be a bloody upheaval in China. Here I think of another regime lacking representative institutions that experienced rapid growth and unparalleled prosperity. I have in find France in the late 18th century. China resembles it in one crucial particular. It was ruled, as is China today, by a regime whose legitimacy was being called into question. In this particular, 18th century France was much better off than China is today. It possessed a monarchy, a millennium old, and that monarchy commanded respect and in many quarters elicited devotion. The old order was nonetheless eroding. The thinking that had produced the glorious revolution in England and the American revolution in America was rapidly gaining ground in France. The aristocracy was resented, birth no longer commanded respect, and when Louis XV, angry that the Parlement stood in his way, briefly cashiered that ancient juridical institution, he undermined 
the foundations of his own authority. As long as the economy grew, the French remained quiet. But when state bankruptcy loomed and the economy came a cropper, they turned with a vengeance on the ruling order. Looking back on these events, Alexis de Tocqueville described what had happened as a revolution of rising expectations. The regime in France is, if in anything, in worse straits than the French monarchy was in the late 18th century. It embodies the rule of a communist party that has renounced communism in practice without renouncing it also in theory, without putting in communism's place another theory of legitimacy. The country is ruled by a formerly red aristocracy. Resentment is rife. In China, as in the Arab world, family loyalty trumps public spiritedness, and those called the princelings, young people descended from those closely associated with Chairman Mao in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, have grown fabulously rich. Corruption is the norm. Everyone knows it, everyone hates it. For no one has articulated a rationale to justify the privileged status of these princelings. 27 years have passed since Tiananmen Square, and nothing of substance has changed. What happened then could easily come to pass again, especially if there were a dramatic slowdown in economic growth. If things are getting better all the time, that is a damper on the resentment inspired by corruption. When things get worse or the economy stagnates, corruption is apt to seem intolerable. And as we sit here pondering China's future, a dramatic economic slowdown is taking place. You should not assume that if things are calm, they will remain so. The French Revolution came out of nowhere. So did the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. So did the Arab Spring. So did the protests in Tiananmen Square. Th there were those who foresaw all four of these developments, but next to no one got the timing of even one of them right. I am not alone in thinking that China is in a pre-revolutionary situation. There are men who know China far better than I do, far better, in fact, than anyone in this room or in the United States. And they think, as I do, I have in mind the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party and the princelings in China possessed of great wealth. Three years ago, shortly before Xi came into power, the leaders of the party asked all of the cadres in China to read Tocqueville's Ancien Regime and the Revolution, the work in which he laid out his thesis that the French Revolution was a revolution of rising expectations. Why, I ask you, would they do this if they did not think that the book had something of vital importance that every last member of the party needed to digest it? It was surely not the fate of France that they chiefly had in mind. If Tocqueville's book is being read, it is because at least some of the men who rule China are wondering whether their country is near a tipping point in which a seemingly minor event, the self-immolation of a Tunisian street vendor, for example, sets off a conflagration. Here's another piece of evidence which shows just how worried the leaders of the party are. Shortly after the party began urging its cadres to read Tocqueville, after Xi had taken over, the new leadership of the Communist Party circulated within the party document number nine, which spelled out seven dangerous values that it was forbidden for anyone to embrace. Here's what's off limits in today's China. Promoting Western constitutional democracy. That's one. Two, promoting universal values such as human rights, which would establish a standard by which the rule of the Chinese Communist Party could be judged. Promoting civil society. That's three, which would compromise the party's monopoly of power. Promoting neoliberalism, which is to say free markets. Promoting the Western idea of journalism, challenging China's principle that the media and publishing system should be subject to party discipline. Six, promoting historical nihilism, which is to say trying to undermine the rosy depiction of the history of the Chinese Communist Party and of the new China promoted by that party. Seven, questioning reform and opening. That is to say, pointing out that uh, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, the phrase that's used by the party, isn't socialist at all, which is to say suggesting that China's red emperor isn't red. This is the China that Xi is fostering, 
And it is a China that he and his minions do not want you to know about. This past April, the 71-year-old Chinese journalist who leaked this document to the Western press was sentenced to seven years in prison. And the princelings. They're desperately trying to get their riches out of China. And they're also going to great lengths to get a foothold the, for their families abroad. They're buying property in the United States and France and Britain and Cyprus. They're sending their wives to have anchor babies in the United States so that someone in the family will have a right to US citizenship. In vast numbers also, 300,000, they're sending their children, many of whom speak little or no English, to American universities. Some of these students are here to get an education. Most are here to search out the means to stay. So I would say to you, by way of conclusion, this, that when the rats begin to abandon the ship, it is because they think it may be beginning to sink. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Paul. We have some time for questions. And our students will be bringing the microphone around to those who have questions. And we ask, uh, one request that we have is that you avoid long-winded questions. <laughs> At the Free Market Forum, short questions are next to godliness. <laughs> Thank you. And direct, uh, when you ask your question, direct who the question is for. Who? We have, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Jorge Rodriguez here. Uh, I'm local in uh, Omaha. I, I have a, a, a correction of uh, Dr. Gilder about the problems with Theranox. Theranox, actually, the problem was that the CEO mistook, mis, uh, actually misspoke or lied about what the use of the blood drawing technique, and she what they're using it for detecting diabetes, cancer, and so on. It's just the typical type of blood draw that everybody else does. So she really lie, and that's the reason why we have a problem now with the FDA. So, you know, when you're gonna criticize regulations, you should say the whole story. I mean, they were screwing up. The other one is- How did they screw up again? I didn't get that point. Theranox, the whole idea of Theranox, she, the CEO suggested that there was a way to draw blood without injections and using just a minute quantity of blood was sufficient for detecting different kinds of diseases. Actually, they were, the, they were using whole blood in large amounts to do all the tests that they were required, just like any other lab does. So they actually misled the investors into thinking that there was a new method to detect medication Okay, so that's just one point that I wanted to make. I, I, I hate to make it so long, but you read the article in the Wall Street Journal, you'll, you'll see that I'm okay. correct. Well, we gave you a chance to ask that part of the question. That's not a question. That was uh, just uh, I think we, let's let uh, Mr. Gilder respond, please. No, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, I, I think it's, I, I suspect that uh, the FDA didn't have to act publicly uh, and, uh, and uh, thwart theramo Theranos's uh, project, but. Uh, I, I do have a question, and I wish also to Mr. Gilder, and it has to, I'm very disappointed of your, the, the, the position you had taken about China. I'm, I'm interested in medicine and things like that. Yeah, One I'm sure you did. Why don't we, I, I'd like to talk to you afterwards. I'll come and talk to you about yeah. it. Yeah, well, well, we'll have the question afterwards. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah, over here, go ahead. My question is for Dr. Ray. Um, Dr. Ray, I'm, I'm a high school teacher right now in Colorado Springs, and a year ago, I had two Chinese students, actually, who were exchange students, and I remember at the end of the year, after learning about things like Tiananmen Square, and those, those students swore that they would never go back, and they made it a plan that they would be able to come here to the United States. So, can you comment a little bit on education and on the role of young people of the next generation in China right now? One of the reasons I think there will at some point be a revolution in China is if you send 300,000 of your young people, especially the children of the elite, 
to this country, uh, they will learn things that are disturbing. Uh, and when they go back home, uh, it could be explosive. Uh, a lot of the people involved in Tiananmen Square had uh, been students abroad. So, you know, it has a, it has a huge impact. Uh, on the other hand, the Chinese um, are working on new techniques of tracing people. Uh, let me quickly read something to you I learned yesterday. China's Communist Party is rolling out a plan to assign everyone in the country citizenship scores. China appears to be leveraging all the tools of the information age, electronic purchasing data, social networks, algorithmic sorting, to construct the ultimate tool of social control. It is, as one commentator put it, authoritarianism gamified. In the system, everyone is measured by a score ranging from 350 to 950, and that score is linked to a national ID card. In addition to measuring your financial credit, it will also measure political compliance, expressing the wrong opinion, or merely having friends who express the wrong opinion will hurt your score. The higher your score, the more privileges the government will accord you. The information age also uh, creates the means a means of social control that go beyond anything the Communist Party in China ever had. It's a danger here, too. Okay. Can I make one comment? Yes, Dr. Wolf, uh, comment. You know, it used to be said that uh, you shouldn't believe everything you hear. <laughs> um, if you look at the internet in the U.S. and social media in the U.S. and compare the content of traffic with the internet use and social media uh, activity in China, there's a lot more talk among young people in the U.S. about revolution than there is among young people in China about revolution. That doesn't mean either of them is right, but it's, it's, uh, it's of dubious validity to accredit some uh, even considerable chatter about revolution in China among young people uh, without acknowledging uh, similar irresponsible comment by young people in the U.S. Okay, do we have another question? Go ahead. My name is uh, Kwa. I'm from Sterling College, uh, Kansas. I have a question for the whole panel. 11 days ago, U.S., our country, concluded the uh, PAC, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, including 12 countries, including U.S. China was invited, but they declined. Can you, can you comment on that? Well, uh, uh, I think China was invited more or less pro forma uh, to participate. I think... Uh, uh, the, Ch the Chinese have been pushing and developing something called the AI, AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, to which the U.S. was invited to participate and which we declined. Um, I think actually for reasons that would take longer than the time we have. Uh, the AIIB is going to be uh, a mare's nest. It's going to be very difficult for China to manage, to navigate uh, for reasons I can uh, tell you about when, at the break. Um, while I think the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, among <clears throat> uh, 12 countries, including the U.S., may or may not get passed by the Congress in the next six months. But if it does get passed, I think it has much more prospect of being successful in, in ways that, are, that can be anticipated and can be measured than the AIIB. So uh, the fact that the, that the Chinese declined 
participation in TPP and that the Americans declined participation in AIIB is a little bit of the competitive uh, worries uh, that, that uh, uh, Mr. Gilder was referring to, but I don't think it's, it's explosive. I think it, they can go their separate ways, and I think if I were a short seller, I would sell AIIB short, and I'd buy TPP long. Yeah, my name is uh, Bill Mesa from uh, Colorado. I have a question for Charles Wolf. Um, you mentioned that corruption is pervasive in China. I'm over here to your left, please. Over there. Yeah. yeah uh, you, you mentioned that corruption is pervasive in China. If it's a normalized practice within the culture, can you um, describe unpacking how less state control could potentially undermine a normalized practice, particularly found, let's say, in uh, some forms of Guangxi? Well, I, I think that there, you know, we're not without uh, our, our f share of scandals and corruption of various sorts. So I think uh, the real world is populated by different shades and different quanta of, of uh, corruption, and ours has its share. I think what Xi Jinping is concerned about is the extent and the growth and the magnitude of corruption pervading the Chinese system, uh, and that that is a significant risk to the, as I said, the longevity and the continuity of the Communist Party. Now, the, the, the logic of his uh, severe uh, anti-corruption campaign is that uh, those who have used government authority, uh, notably in quite high places including the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, uh, and including uh, former defense ministers, and, and uh, not particularly princelings, but, but to a much later, lesser extent, princelings have part. The billionaires in China are not princelings. They're, they're entrepreneurs, they're Chinese capitalists with, social, with communist uh, with, with Chinese characteristics uh, uh, and so forth. So I think that uh, uh, the logic is that of the Xi Jinping uh, anti-corruption campaign is that if there's less oversight and less authority vested in uh, the government all top-level government officials are members of the Communist Party, all. Um, there will be, if there's less uh, uh, penetration and authority uh, in the government uh, that, that extends to the, uh, to the economy, there'll be fewer opportunities for uh, the exercise of public authority for personal aggrandizement. And, uh, that in part the effort to eliminate or re reduce that uh, authority will have a, a beneficial effect uh, in terms of PR within China. Uh, and to the extent that the, uh, the effort is successful, it will make the system function more efficiently. I think he's right. We have another question. This, this is a question about the reliability of the data we hear about Chinese growth. I've been fascinated to hear the, the, what we've heard for a long time about how rapidly China is growing. But at the same time, these remar there are these remarkable stories and videos about the huge shopping malls that are empty and apartment complexes that don't have anyone in them. And I wonder if, that, if those apartment complexes and shopping malls are counted as valuable output from the Chinese system, if so, then I, don't they very badly distort the amount of real growth that is happening? Well, you raise a good question. I think that uh, a, a degree of, of uh, skepticism uh, about the data, uh, the statistics in China is, is warranted. The data that I was referring to about, uh, and that Mr. Gilder uh, alluded to uh, indirectly, um, 
represents some uh, screening and, and uh, correction of, of official data uh, that was that I've reviewed, it wasn't done by Rand, it was done by the Peterson Institute in Washington, uh, Nick Lardy, uh, and it makes some allowances for uh, misreporting uh, uh, and generally is about the most accurate data that we have. Uh, hello, uh, this is a question for, for uh, professors, uh, Professor Wolf and Ray as well. Um, Pardon me, I'm an economist at Gordon College, or Douglas Puffery, but I'm an amateur person with, uh, I have an amateur interest, I suppose, in foreign affairs, and um, what, I'd, what I'd like is uh, your comments on China's recent foreign policy adventurism, particularly its uh, claims to the South China Sea and so forth, and um, it strikes me that this, or for that matter, some of its moves in Tibet and elsewhere are partly for domestic political consumption to um, stir up nationalism, and, uh, and of course the, uh, the parallels to Germany leading up to the First World War are particularly um, uh, dismaying here, uh, partly because when the First World War started, the Socialist Party and the Reichstag uh, joined others in voting for war credits. And so I wonder to what extent this adventurism is designed to stir up nationalism and support for the government in, and uh, to turn people away from uh, worrying about the economic problems and perhaps to gain further legitimacy for the regime and that this in itself could be profoundly destabilizing and, um, and perhaps put off uh, the pressure for reform in China and as well as uh, disrupting the international politics of the area. Thanks. I'd say two things at the same time uh, exist. Um, one is uh, the uh, position of the Chinese Co Communist Party, its authority, its moral authority, depends on its success in making China prosperous, but also making China great. So uh, part of the answer is uh, that um, if the Chinese Communist Party were to recover Taiwan, Taiwan for China, it would seen, be seen as a coup by the people in China. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, that having been said, I also think that the leadership um, wants to dominate Asia. Uh, and I suspect that they can be deterred. Um, Deterrence is not something that necessarily leads to war. In fact, often it leads to peace because a certain sobriety then enters into calculations. The, Their currency George? policy is to defend the dollar against American efforts to devalue it. I mean, that uh, you know, the U.S. has a co real commitment to floating currencies. It uh, deriving from uh, Milton Friedman's uh, advice to Nixon to leave the gold standard. Uh, the Chinese don't agree with that. The head of the Chinese Central Bank is uh, Zhou Ji Chang, who was uh, assistant to Jiang in uh, Shanghai and is a very pro-capitalist figure who uh, worships the economics of Robert Mundell, uh, for, who is the founder of supply-side economics with Art, Art Laffer, the Laffer-Mundell uh, system. And uh, Mundell focused on monetary stability. And uh, the Chinese believe in monetary stability and have a real uh, gold orientation like Mundell does and uh, and uh, the head of the Chinese Central Bank gave a speech a couple years ago this is uh, Joe Joe C H Z H O U uh, he uh, urging a new Bretton Woods agreement to uh, reverse the Nixon uh, a uh, floating currency regime and perhaps establish uh, Bancor, uh, which I think of as uh, 
in the modern digital age, a Bitcoin standard of some sort that can grow on the internet and become a new global uh, currency. Uh, they're just, uh, there are a lot of things going on in China. There is all kinds of cross currents and, and the worst part of China is the absolute top leadership. They are, uh, there's no question about that, but, but they're now, uh, Everybody is uh, trading stocks, and uh, it's you know they have more Christians than uh, Communist Party members. Uh, it's there are a lot of things going on. Thank you, George. That's all the time we have, and thank you very much for attending this session on China. I'll turn it over to Anita. Thank you, gentlemen. That was most interesting. Uh, we are now please. <laughs>